Okay, Road to War. Which war? World War II, of course. Um, let's see if I can make this go away. Hmm. I wasn't up before. Okay. Um, so this week, I want to create a series of um, teaching videos, I guess, through these slide decks. Um, because the next step in Unit 7 is looking at the road to war, events that lead up to this next world war, World War II. Um, you can see the standards at the bottom of the screen, um, history standard. And so we'll be looking at was the Treaty of Versailles effective, was the League of Nations affected, what alliances were created um, during this time period prior to the actual beginning of World War II. Um, also, you see an economic standard explaining competition re for resources and how it affects economic relationships. So we're going to see, of course, Hitler expanding the German Empire and um, Japan is going to play a role in that as well. So um, in our first walk down this road to war, we're going to look at how did Hitler's actions in the late 1930s violate the Treaty of Versailles. Um, so we need to go back and look at the consequences to Germany from the Treaty of Versailles. I pulled this out of the GoFormative that we did, um, the information that's in your interactive notebook. So if you remember the guilt clause, the war guilt clause, Germany was forced to accept full responsibility for the war. Um, Germany had to pay billions in reparations and Germany had to reduce their armed forces and give up many of their colonies and the League of Nations gave control of certain German colonies to France and Great Britain. So those were the four main consequences um, for Germany from the Treaty of Versailles, which effectively ended World War I. How did Germans react to the treaty? Well, if you remember, some of them were really shocked. They were angry. You know, Germany was not invited to the conference at Versailles that created this treaty that Germans did not agree with the guilt clause, blaming Germany and them having to take sole responsibility for World War I. Um, and they didn't want to have to pay the billions. Um, you know, felt like, of course, that they did not have a voice. You know, some Germans, if you remember, were very upset with their leaders for signing off on the Treaty of Versailles. And then if you see the poster, from the 1930s claims that only the Nazi party, which we're going to look at in this slide deck today, um, would be able to free Germany from this lie of the guilt clause or the sole blame for World War I. So um, if you remember from last week's work, you know, we've got an economic, worldwide economic depression going on. People are out of jobs. They're hungry. They're poor. They're angry about the Treaty of Versailles. So it's just a perfect recipe for a, a dictator, a totalitarian leader to rise up if they can actually convince the people that what they're saying is true. So Hitler's good at that. So his actions definitely violate the Treaty of Versailles. Let's look at which ones. So remember consequence number three, where Germany had to reduce armed forces and give up many of their colonies. Well, Hitler does the exact opposite of that. And he actually creates the German Air Force, known as the Luftwaffe. Um, you can see the symbol of the German Air Force and some planes, you know, as a result of him creating the German Air Force, the exact opposite of consequence number three. Here's some uniforms, um, just an example of the uniforms that were created for the Air Force. Some of you might find this interesting. And in addition, he builds up the um, German army. He does this in secret where, you know, the countries involved with the Treaty of Versailles are unaware. He starts in March um, of 1935. He starts a program called conscription, which means to be forced to participate in your um, country's armed forces. The United States has a form of conscription. It's called the Selective Service. Any of my male students, when you turn 18, you have to sign up for the selective service. If we went to war to where we would need our armies built up pretty quickly, then you would be called into what's um, known as the draft. 
and you would be forced to train in one of our military branches um, to serve in that war. The draft has been used in the past. Um, yeah, I believe it was used for World War II, um, the Korean War, and the Vietnam War. So um, that's what conscription means. We call it the draft. And so Hitler starts that, and you can see in the information that I provide that about 100,000 more forced soldiers were trained each year. So due to the secret training, the army was already bigger than the Treaty of Versailles allowed. How else did Hitler's actions violate the Treaty of Versailles? Well, remember consequence number four, where the League of Nations had actually taken away some of Germany's lands. So you can see the bright yellow was land taken from Germany and given to Poland after World War I. Um, the orange is land that was taken away from Germany and given to the Soviet Union after World War I. And then green is what was left of Germany after World War I. So that was, um, this is a map, you know, kind of the consequences. Number four. So how does Hitler react to this? Well, he actually takes over Austria. And then he wants part of um, the Czechos <clears throat> Czechoslovakia known as the Sudetenland. I'm going to try to figure out how I can show you this video within this video. So I'll do that in a few minutes, but I'm going to talk you through some points um, before I get to that. So Hitler, pretty much, he's starting this whole program of nationalism, ultra-nationalism. He only wants German-born, German pure blood um, people to be part of the German Empire. And any of you that know the history of Hitler, he is not German-born or German purebred, but he believes that he can, you know, create this perfect Aryan race of Germans. So he wants this area in Czechoslovakia that was known as the Sudetenland. And so that's what's in these um, dotted green areas on top of the orange, the numbers one, 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 the Sudetenland. Um, and he wants this because this is where supposedly these um, natural born Germans live. And so he wants them to be part of um, Germany. So what happens in Czechoslovakia um, first so if you look up here, I have the Munich Agreement, and this is where I'm going to try and get this video to play for you in a few minutes. But um, so leaders of France and Great Britain, they come along and they basically tell the Czechoslovakians to just give in to this area, to Hitler, um, you know, appease him, go back to our vocabulary, you know, give in just to kind of keep the peace and move on. But Czechoslovakians say, um, no way. And they sent out about a million of their soldiers to protect their borders here. So all of this along the number ones again. Well, the Munich Agreement, the conference at Munich takes place. Um, France is there, Great Britain's there, Italy's there, Germany's there. Guess who's not invited? You got it, the Czechoslovakians. This should be coming a bit of a pattern that you're starting to notice if we go back to the scramble for Africa and the imperialism um, of those countries who did they not invite to the Berlin Conference? Ding, 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 you got it right, that's right, the Africans. And then when we move into the end of World War I and the conference at Versailles, who was not invited to the conference? Yep, you got it right again, Germany, right? Because, um, you know, it was going to be all about them and what was going to happen to them, like the Berlin Conference was all about what was going to happen in Africa. So as this pattern tends to go at the conference in Munich, they did not invite the Czechoslovakians. So you've got this um, pattern of these more powerful um, industrialized countries, militarized countries, using that power to set up rules or set up the way things are going to happen in other countries, you know, and don't really consider the smaller countries' views or how it might actually impact them. So at the Munich Agreement, they don't invite the Czechoslovakians. 
and they actually draw up an agreement giving Hitler or Germany this area, the number, the ones with the green dots, uh, known as the Sudeik Land. Um, and when the Czechoslovakians hear about this, and they know that now they're not going to have any help if they try to go to war with against Germany. You know, France is not going to help them. Italy is not going to help them. Great Britain is not going to help them. So they give in and just say, okay, you can have this area because they know that it would be a futile war. I mean, like they're going to lose no matter what because this big army is going to come in. So <clears throat> Hitler gets his way through the Munich Agreement and gets this area. A few months later, all these other numbers, five, five, four, six, two, six, three, he also takes over. So um, we see him continuing to violate the Treaty of Versailles. He actually goes against the Munich Agreement. It was signed um, with the agreement that Hitler would stop there with the number one, numbers one, but he didn't. So from the Munich conference, what did France and Britain hope would happen if Hitler was granted the Sudetenland? You know, well, they were hoping for peace and that Hitler would just stop there. What really happened? Hitler continues to grow the German Empire and this is some of the steps that leads to World War II. <clears throat> so I told you we were gonna look at the Nazi party a little bit today because this is also a violation of the Treaty of Versailles. This is where this nationalist party, you know, grows into um, to, into play in the history of Germany. So it's known as the Third Reich. We don't really call it that. You know, it's common just talking about history people. We call it the Nazi party. But if you do readings or you watch movies or things like that, you will hear the term Third Reich. You read across the bottom with me the caption that I give you. The Third Reich is the official Nazi name for the rule in Germany from January 1933 to May 1945. It's known as the Third Reich because it was the third time, the third ruling. Um, it succeeded the Holy Roman Empire, which should have been at the end of your sixth grade year of the Middle Ages. Um, so that was the first Reich. And then the German Empire rules from 1871 to 1918. That's the second Reich. So this growing of this party is the third right or the third rule of Germany. It began as the German Workers Party. Hitler becomes a member of the German Workers Party. Um, he starts having meetings. He places the ads. So this is the beginning of his propaganda program against the Jews. He placed the ads, as you can see by the second bullet point, in for meetings in anti-Semitic newspapers. This means newspapers that are against the Jews. Um, he starts having these meetings in like diners, cafes, bars, where he knows the common worker will be, you know, at the end of the work day. And he's a persuasive speaker. He's, you know, listening to them, listening to their wants, their needs, their fears, and he's responding to it with actual, you know, ways that he's going to make life better. He changes the name of this German Workers' Party to National Socialist German Workers' Party, what we know as the Nazis. So what did the Nazis want? Well, several things, but out of the several things, they definitely wanted the Treaty of Versailles to be done. They didn't want the to have to go with the guilt clause. They didn't want to be paying any more money back. They didn't want to keep all of their profits that they had from the war. They wanted to take away the civil rights of the Jews. So those are some of the things that the Nazi party wanted to happen. So the swastika, which I have in the background, I'll give you a little history on it. In ancient times, this actually was associated with religions, um, be associated with the sun, it was a symbol of peace or tranquility, and even in modern day, can be seen in um, Buddhist temples and shrines. So how did it become such a symbol of hate and persecution in modern day? Well, due to incorrect translations in Sanskrit, which was the Indian language, and German dictionaries, Hitler believed that the swastika was a symbol that represented the word Swazi, which meant Aryan, and that's that race that group of people, pure Germans, that he wanted to create. This is not the case, but this is how this symbol 
um, of sun, tranquility, peace has become a symbol of persecution and hate over history. Again, why did Hitler rise to power so easily? We looked at this some last week with the rise of our totalitarian leaders. Um, just as a reminder, you know, the whole world is in the middle of this economic depression. Germany had created this hyperinflation where they were just printing more money, but they didn't have any more gold to back it up. Hitler was a World War I hero. Um, they, Germany knew him as a hero of their World War I, and so they're listening to him, and he's talking about bringing glory back to Germany. He's talking about, you know, keeping communism out of Germany. They're hearing about communism through what's going on in Russia. He's telling them that he will create jobs, that everyone will have a job. He's going to, you know, do great things for the economy. Everyone's going to have a car, a Volkswagen. Um, so, and a lot of these things are starting to come true. So the people actually see that Hitler is able to put his uh, money where his mouth is, so to speak, as that saying goes. So he's actually making these things happen. Um, and in addition to that, while he's doing this, he is constantly preaching the blame of Jews for Germany's problem, not the German people. So there you see part of his rise to power, why he was so appealing to the common man. He was creating jobs. He was making their economy better. And he wasn't blaming them for Germany's problems. So two questions I want you to think about and send me some answers to from this first day. Um, how effective was the Treaty of Versailles at keeping peace or at stopping Hitler from expanding Germany? And number two, why do you think countries like France and Great Britain just kind of gave in to Hitler, appeased him, his demands for places like the Sudan land? As you can see at the bottom, I want you to send me your answers however you want. You can send me your answers through email. You can make a Google slide. Um, you can create a chatter pics. I'll set up a flip code assignment for those of you like to do it. You can do an iMovie. However, you want to send me your answer to these two questions. I'm going to compile your answers and I'll share them out as classes. Also, if you have any questions or comments about Hitler's actions violating the Treaty of Versailles, please make sure that you include those as well so that we can address them as a class. Okay, now I'm going to try to go back in and see if I can't hook this short Munich agreement video into this. Don't forget about sending me your answers to these questions. 